Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, dwyervip.com, both free sites. Today is February the 28th, 2018. Just updating an earlier video I did on Luis Ortiz's challenge of Deontay Wilder's heavyweight title. But first remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Before I go further, let me just say, and again, today's February 28th, 2018, there is a great article in Bitcoinist.com for those interested in making money, right? They interview the rapper Nipsey Hussle. And let me just say, Nipsey Hussle knows cryptocurrency. I agree with everything Nipsey Hussle has to say, especially when he starts talking about how cryptocurrency, as good as it's been, is really going to hit a new strata when companies like Amazon start accepting it. Right? Again, it's Bitcoinist.com, Nipsey Hussle. He's been involved with cryptocurrency for years. Right? I want millennials especially. With all this misinformation out there, I want millennials to do their research, go to that article, check out what Hustle has to say, read other articles on Bitcoinists and other cryptocurrency information sources. Now, in talking about this Ortiz fight, right, Ortiz Wilder, let me just share with you two facts of life I've learned over the years, right? One of them is that when the facts make it necessary, you need to break with the crowd, right? Now, let me just say, whether it's investing or whether it's sports betting, which, of course, here, at least on my side, we consider to be the same thing. Let me just say, Jim Chanos, one of the world's best investors, one of the world's best short sellers, broke with the crowd on Enron. Now, it's hard to believe that there was a time when companies like WorldCom and Enron were considered the future of business, right? You might recall Enron had an operational head, Jeff Skilling, who went to Harvard and had some highfalutin resume, right? The owner of Enron, the top guy, was Ken Lay. Well, you know the rest. Jim Chanos saw the price going up, 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 up. Saw the ad campaign going up, 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 up. Saw the prestige with the public going up, 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 up. And he decided to look under the hood. He didn't like what he saw. He noticed that debt liability was being outsourced. Right? He figured out that for all the hype, the company was full of hot air. He started shorting the stock. People thought he was crazy. By the way, this is a recurring theme in business. Same thing with Peter Schiff and the real estate crisis. People thought he was crazy until he wasn't. That company was a sham. It went under. You know what happens when a sham's exposed. Everyone claims to not have known the truth, including Jeff Skilling and Ken Lay. Right? Well, right now, you have gold and silver in the toilet. I believe silver is down year over year. But certain investors, Mike Maloney comes to mind, the owner of goldsilver.com. Right? He firmly believes in gold and silver. He doesn't even consider himself a gold bug. He's in gold and silver by necessity because it's so undervalued, right? That's why he's put together the group he's put together. I believe history is going to prove him right. For the record, I'm in gold and silver, right? For the record, I'm in a bunch of cryptocurrencies. So how does it apply to this fight? Well, just understand the casinos are telling you, the public is telling you, that Deontay Wilder is the favorite in this fight. I'm seeing that he's a three to one favorite in some places, a minus 300, right? Folks, that's 
absurd. Right? That's that's simply ridiculous. Let me just say why I think it's ridiculous, why I believe the underdog, Luis Ortiz, and casinos have spreads. I believe the best price I've seen on Ortiz so far is a plus 225, right? In other words, bet 10 bucks to win $22.50 plus the return of your $10, right? Let's just say this. Looking at Wilder, and I know Wilder's an Olympic medalist. I understand Wilder's unbeaten. I understand he's knocked out every man he's faced. Great. But just understand, at some point, the big picture has to take over. When you look at a Wilder fight, in my opinion, Wilder can't fight small. In other words, he's a tall guy who uses his height to win fights. He's not a guy in the trenches who can bend down, hide his head, right? Have stuff tucked from a closed stance, throw power punches, not long right hands that you need distance to throw, but great hooks, hooks with force against an opponent who's not hurt like Sergei Lakovic was, but an opponent who's fully conscious. Right now, both of these men, Ortiz and Wilder, are big men. I'm just telling you, Ortiz is going to look a lot smaller than Wilder when they actually engage, because Ortiz understands that he can get under Wilder, that he can get inside on Wilder where he'll actually be able to punch harder than Wilder. And Wilder's calling card is as a KO puncher, right? Only one fight Wilder's had has gone the distance, right? He remains Stavern, the first fight. He knocks out Stavern in the first round of the second fight. But just to understand, Wilder's opponents tend to be a lot like Stavern. I believe Stavern deep in the pocket is probably better than Deontay Wilder. Not probably is better than Deontay Wilder. Just compare and contrast Stavern's fights against Chris Ariola, where Stavern owns the pocket, to Wilder's fight against Chris Ariola. Make no mistake, too. Ariola's in shape when he fights Stavern. Ariola on short notice fights Wilder. Right? But a Bermain Stavern needs to be close to you to do damage. So the first fight, Wilder shoots a jab, stays outside. The second fight, Wilder hits him with a devastating long right hand from distance. Now the public sees a dramatic KO. What the public did not see was Deontay Wilder in the pocket breakdown remains to burn. Let me just say, the public saw exactly that. When Luis Ortiz, from the pocket, broke down Bryant Jennings. Understand, that's what Ortiz does. He's a chess player. He moves, but he's not running. He's moving on his front foot. Right? He picks angles. He's difficult. He's a southpaw, not a righty. He's a southpaw. So he's coming in at certain angles. He's also what I call adaptive reactive. In other words, you'll notice him making adjustments. In the Brian Jennings fight, he figures out that he can land uppercuts. Right? Needless to say, he gets inside on Jennings and then starts doing exactly that. He's a master at cutting off the ring. Just contrast the fact that Jennings, and I'll agree, Jennings fights the wrong fight against him. But understand, Jennings is a guy who went 12 rounds with Vladimir Klitschko. Klitschko had a hard time finding Jennings. Luis Ortiz did not. Right? 
I believe these two guys are from opposite sides of the street. I believe Wilder is a dominant athlete. When you look at him, he's very coordinated. You forget how tall he is. He's a dominant athlete who can do things like break out a jab. He has a very good jab and move away from Bermain's to Vern and be completely coordinated, even though that's not his game. Right? He's not even up on the tips of his toes when he's fighting Bermain Stavern the first fight. He's just walking around the ring and he's coordinated. He's a great athlete. By contrast, Ortiz is not a great athlete. That's probably one of the reasons why he has been busted at least a couple of times using unauthorized substances. Right? But, whereas Wilder, for the baseball fans, is a fastball pitcher. In other words, he's the guy out there with the physical gifts. He can get the ball up around 98, 100 miles an hour. He's a Rollis Chapman. Right? Understand that Luis Ortiz is a math guy. He has a fastball, but he has a curveball. He has a slider. He has a change. He's working the count. He has a construct. He's figuring out what you want to do, and he's locating the ball in different places. So, here's what I think is going to happen. Wilder's fight against Gerald Washington. That's an important fight. You'll notice that Wilder hardly throws any punches early in the fight. Folks, he's frozen by Washington's movement. Understand that Washington was one of the more mobile guys to face Wilder. Wilder's a guy who is just looking to land that straight right hand. He'll try to set it up a little bit with a jab, but he's just looking to land that straight right hand. So when you're in there and you're not in range of that right hand and you're moving around the ring and you're coming in at different angles like Washington did masterfully, Forget what the judges thought of that fight. I thought Washington was winning that fight. Right? Wilder freezes. Wilder goes low volume. That's what happens when you're a right hand specialist and someone takes away the right hand from you. Right? Now, Ortiz understands. He doesn't want to go back on Wilder. Right? Wilder is really a three point shooter, isn't he? He likes to throw stuff from distance. You don't want to walk into Wilder's hot zone. You want to come forward on Wilder. But when you look at Ortiz fights, you'll find out that Ortiz, a southpaw, comes in at angles. Right? Not just diagonally with his feet. But you'll notice that Ortiz can get small when he needs to, can get tall when he needs to. So I think as Ortiz starts hunting Wilder down, that's what I expect to happen, folks. The guy with the big KO percentage is going to get hunted down. I'm expecting Wilder to be baffled early in the fight. Baffled. And I'm expecting Ortiz a better than two to one underdog. To come in to rough up Wilder and Ortiz, a vet with an extensive amateur pedigree, right, is not going to allow Wilder to tie him up like Chris Ariola did. In other words, you can get inside and have elbows out. Guy tries to tie you up, you have a hand free, right? Wilder is slender. He doesn't have a lot of meat on his torso to absorb punches. Ortiz is a great body puncher. More importantly, Ortiz can camouflage punches. Looks like he's going to the body. Oh, it's an uppercut. Yeah, looks like he's going to the body. Oh, he turns it upstairs. Inside Ortiz knows that when he's fully conscious, 
Wilder's not going to be able to windmill with hooks like he did at the end of the Sergei Lakovic fight. Look at that fight. And as he did against Audley Harrison. You remember Harrison gets hit with a straight right hand. I, I have no idea what Harrison was looking for in that fight, right? Wilder comes in with, you know, <laughs> the punch you expect. And Harrison's completely baffled. Harrison goes down, right? Harrison gets off the canvas. You'll notice when Wilder comes over to him, Wilder's just windmilling. That's who he is, right? He's not a guy who, after he hurts you, is going to come in and is going to look at the lay of the land and be surgical, right? Let me say, too, that Wilder has no Vladimir Klitschko's on his resume, right? That's important because I would argue that Brian Jennings, who Ortiz B, is better than anybody Wilder has fought. In other words, Wilder doesn't have an experience advantage against Luis Ortiz. He just doesn't. Right? The guys he's been fighting don't have a lot of foot speed, right? Apart from Gerald Washington. Don't have a lot of foot speed. Couldn't outmaneuver him around the ring. Some of them fought mind-blowingly bad fights. Some other fights that could have been interesting. Got stopped early, right? Under some really odd circumstances, right? Um... I thought the Lakovic fight was interesting. Wilder, in my opinion, when he's windmilling, hits Lakovic behind the ear a couple of times. I'm not sure if those were legal shots. I'll leave it up to you to look up the tape. Right? The Malik Scott fight would have been interesting because Malik Scott could actually move and stick a jab. Now, why Malik Scott decided to linger by the ropes... <laughs> why Malik Scott fought the fight he fought why Audley Harrison fought the fight he fought against Wilder is anyone's guess I can tell you Eric Molina had Wilder badly hurt in that fight badly hurt in my opinion Molina was one punch away from being heavyweight champion Right? So, in terms of experience, I don't give Wilder the edge. I really don't. Right? Keep in mind, too, as I said before, that Ortiz is a lefty. Now, they claim the way to beat lefties is with straight right hands. Wilder can throw a great right hand from distance. Can he get one off up close? Not only that, if there's a heavyweight who can slip a straight right hand, I would say it's Luis Ortiz. Because Luis Ortiz is a master at angles. Finally, let me say this. I mentioned two facts of life. The first was that when the facts make it necessary, you need to break with the crowd. Quite frankly, that's where the big profits are. Right? You saw that recently in the uh, George Groves win over Chris Eubank. Eubank was the favorite in that fight. Right, The second lesson I've learned that I want to discuss here is don't be fooled by what political consultant Roger Stone calls possession. Right, I know there are many fans who look at this fight and say, Wilder's the champ. He's the champ for a reason. I'm going to give the champ the benefit of the doubt. Right? Folks, throw the title out. That's going to be up for grabs at the start of this fight. 
right? Skill-wise, in my opinion, the fight's not close. Ortiz just does more in the ring than Deontay Wilder. Ortiz will be able to duck a jab. Think about it. Remains to Vern had a problem with Wilder's jab. The first fight, right? Ortiz, a lefty, has made a career out of ducking jabs from right-handed fighters. Ortiz is by the jab. So the question is going to be, what can Wilder do inside against Ortiz? Right? Because I think Wilder isn't going to be able to circle Ortiz because Ortiz is too good at cutting off the ring. Right? This isn't the first Remains to Vern fight. Right? The jab's not going to land, Wilder's jab, and Wilder's not going to be able to circle. So Wilder's going to have to fight. In which fight has Wilder shown you the ability to trade with a marksman from the pocket? Right? I also don't think you're going to have the lulls in the action that you had in Wilder against Arthur Spielka. Now, I know knockouts cause amnesia. Spielka loses the fight, right? Spielka gets knocked out hard, right? According to folklore, Wilder hits him, turns around and says he's gone before Spielka hits the canvas, right? Okay, fine. I want you to remember the rounds preceding Spielka getting stopped. Again, don't rely on the judges' scorecards, right? Judges are blinded by possession. Right? I get the feeling in some of these fights, they look over at the champ and the glare off that belt, right? The status, he's the champ, he's the favorite, just blinds them. Right? I saw that Spielka Wilder fight as a very competitive fight. And obviously, I'm getting calls about it in the middle of a video. Right? I thought it was a I saw it as a very competitive fight. Wilder's falling for Spielka's face. Wilder, at times, in that fight, is low volume. I don't believe Ortiz is going to fight like Spielka. Right? I don't think Ortiz is going to allow Wilder to think. So, here's the bets I love. I'm going to give you two different hedges. Right? Just like in the George Grove situation. Plus 225. I like Ortiz to win the fight. Right? I think Ortiz is the better boxer. I believe you're going to know by the fourth round that Wilder has no shot at a decision unless he drops Ortiz multiple times. So one side of the bet is Ortiz simply to win. The side of the bet that changes based on your risk tolerance, right? For those who just want to be covered, who don't want to risk fatigue, Deontay Wilder by KO, right? As long as it's better than minus 225, which is, you know, you're getting a plus 225 on the Ortiz win side. This tangible. For those who want a little bit more action, who want the chance at winning both sides of the hedge, I like the under nine and a half rounds. Because in my opinion, either Wilder catches Ortiz early before Ortiz can figure out the angles, or Ortiz figures out the angles, and then destroys Deontay Wilder. Ortiz wins by KO in the first nine and a half rounds. In other words, if he wins by KO before the midway point, ninth round, and yes, I'm aware of the fact that Wilder has never been stopped. Right? That tells me that when Wilder gets hit by Ortiz, the shots, he's going to be unprepared for that. Right? You win both sides of the play. If Wilder is able to end the show in the first nine and a half rounds, and it's an uneven hedge, the 
under is a minus 160. Right? If Wilder comes out and gets the KO, then at least you get some of your money back on the hedge. Right? You will have swung for the fences on a plus 225 Ortiz to win the play. And if Wilder gets the KO inside of nine and a half rounds, then you can say, okay, well, I'm getting back some of my money at minus 160. But I want everyone here to understand the risk involved. Right? If the fight goes to a decision, and if the judges are blinded by Wilder, and if they're afraid to have a champion, heavyweight champion, lose the title by way of a decision, if Wilder wins a decision, you can lose it all. If, right, you take the adventurous hedge, Ortiz to win, had to be under nine and a half rounds. If Ortiz, who's not a great athlete, gets tired and gets stopped after the midway point of the 10th round, you lose it all. Understand, Wilder did go 12 against the main Stavert. I would argue that Stavert didn't push him. Like Luis Ortiz is going to push him. In sum, I'm expecting Luis Ortiz to win the heavyweight title. Right? I'll hedge the play with the under nine and a half rounds at a minus 160 or with Deontay Wilder by K. If that's how I see the fight. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section to the video. Thanks for stopping by.